Log on, tune in, find out. Another good idea from Cambridge. OK, well, I'm Steve Temple. I'm going to talk about inkjet. I'm going to talk about the inkjet cluster, which is a, a prime example of what uh, Alan's been talking about and of the development of entrepreneurship in Cambridge from the very earliest days of the Cambridge phenomenon, before anybody had even got around to calling it the Cambridge phenomenon. Uh, and I'm going to talk about Tsar in particular, which was my baby and contribution to this cluster. Um, I'm going to go right back to 1975. Now, I joined Cambridge Consultants in 1968, and I finally got free of it in 1990, which wasn't my intention. I intended to get free of it long before that, because when I joined, you were expected to form a spin-off within five years of being, uh, becoming a member of the company. That was the ambiance in 1968 of Cambridge Consultants, and it still is today. You expect to go to Cambridge Consultants and start something big. I might say one of the attributes that Alan didn't talk about, but which was clearly there in his discussion, is arrogance. Uh, Cambridge Consultants is one of the most arrogant companies I have ever come across. <laughs> it believes that it knows better than everybody else in the world, even though it has no specific expertise in whatever subject it is it's decided about. And it's of, in my experience, and most of the entrepreneurs I know, that they have that quality of arrogance because they believe they can bring to you, the general public, something you are going to love, but which you've never even thought of. That is an arrogant point of view. And just to give a real in, um, illustration of that, in 1975 or thereabouts, perhaps a, a year or two before that, one of the founder members of Cambridge Consultants, a chap called David Southard, went to a printing company and came back all excited at the idea of digital printing. Now think about it. In 1975, the IC had not been invented, the integrated circuit. You had transistors and indeed valves, but you did not have integrated circuits. So digital printing, what's, what's going to produce the digits? I don't know, there weren't even mini computers. There were big mainframe computers in air-conditioned rooms and things like that. But there was no such thing as a mini or a micro computer. Still, this chap thought digital printing. And of course, being arrogant, we thought, oh great, yes, we'll do that. The electronics will take that for red. Um, even though it's not been invented yet, but the real problem is the mechanics. How are we going to get a blob of ink, a colour, into the right place on a substrate paper, whatever you have uh, on demand? And so we started to think about the mechanics of it. And another chap at CCL, who was really the sort of founder of the inkjet business and worked right through to the early years of Tsar, a chap called David Payton, whose name you've never heard of before, um, and probably won't again because he's now dead. But uh, he invented the technology which later became Domino and half a dozen other spin-outs that were on uh, uh, Alan's picture. And his vision was book on demand. He wanted to be able to go into Heifer's and say, I want a copy of this or that out of print book. And they would say, just a minute, and print a copy of it. Now, you can actually do that today, and particularly in America, a lot of course material is printed for students as a custom print, uh, not using inkjet, I might say, but the vision of book on demand is, is now a realistic thing. We got into bed with a, a little company called ICI, in Imperial Chemical Industries, in case you don't know, who wanted to make custom fabrics and wallpapers, and we made a machine in the early 70s that produced literally that. But ICI turned it down. This is typical. I like to use failed corporate ventures as a, a, a springboard for entrepreneurship. Uh, it's a jolly good way of getting that early funding, the soft um, entry that Alan talked about. There are lots of failed corporate projects that have become great uh, subjects for entrepreneurship, of which the best known one is probably Apple. Apple originated in Xerox labs and the Xerox people turned it down, no market for it. You don't want to drive a computer with a mouse, to use a keyboard, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so the guys who had invented it said, well, do you mind if we take it away and set up our own company? And they called it Apple. So failed corporate ventures is a very good uh, springboard. This is the Cambridge Inkjet family. 
Um, I'm not going to go right through this, but early on, Graham Minto spun off Domino. Um, later, Mike Keeling spun off Willett. Later, Graham Martin spun off Elmjet. And at this point, he was helped by a chap called Bob Hook, who'd started a venture group at CCL, and CCL was then finding finance to support these spin-offs in a really serious manner. And Bob Hook was himself a venture capitalist. He raised venture capital funds and then uh, spent those on seeding startups. And he's been responsible for many years for some of the greatest startups around Cambridge. Uh, and then David and I and Bob started Zar in 1990 as a result of another failed corporate venture, and then Bill Baxter. Incidentally, three of these companies, Elmjet, Lynx, and Woolit, are now all owned by an American company called Danaher. But I'm very proud to say that Domino and Zar are still independent. They're both publicly listed companies. Uh, and Inca is owned by a Japanese company. How did Zar work? Well, we were a technology company in 1987, very much the sort of soft startup that uh, Alan was talking about, uh, backed by an American corporate. Uh, the American corporate then got cold feet, and just like Xerox, and got out of the technology, at which point Bob Hook um, funded it through venture capital, and we started a licensing business, which ran from about 1990 to 2000. And then we thought, well, you know, that's, that's a limited uh, way of doing things, so we'll, we'll go into the real world and start manufacturing, which we did initially by the rather neat mechanism of buying back one of our licensees. So we'd sold a license to IBM uh, in 1993 for about three million pounds, and in 1999, by which time that project had completely failed and gone bust, we bought the result back for rather less than three million pounds and acquired a complete factory with um, a design of Printhead and, and also customers, uh, and never looked back. And in 2006, we opened our own factory in England. We've created a manufacturing business in England, would you believe? And just to give you a sort of idea of how the company developed in financial terms, it's now worth about 110 million, so not an enormous amount of money. But I'd like to point out that Zars licensees and the business worldwide that is generated by Zars um, print heads and the like is, is worth something in the order of a billion pounds. Um, the initial investment by the corporate was about a million. The VCs spent about one and a half million. We did a private placing for a million. We did an IPO for 10 million, but we actually got 25 million through licensing. In other words, the majority of the company's capital came from the licensing business. So it's a good, good model, that. And it now has a turnover of about 48 million. Quickly, because I'm running out of time, what does it do? These are print heads. These each have 1,000 nozzles in them. Each nozzle can deliver um, 130,000 drops a second of varying size. These eat data at astronomic rates. It's a real headache, even in today's world, for the electronics to provide the data to make the print head work. And it's always been my ambition to give electronics engineers a headache. <laughs> 